we put out a call to some of your fans for questions, and, and we have some that, that, that I would like to ask you here. Uh, the first one, I think you've kind of answered, what did you do in finance? I think we, we know that now, but the, the person who asked the question said, I'm in public accounting, and I like how you handle business in the Demon Accords. So could you speak to that a little bit, uh, how, how the business aspect of your life worked its way into your books? Well, I, I think it's just another aspect of writing what you know. Um, and, and I'm sure Michael will agree with this, but when you're asking somebody to suspend uh, belief uh, in the fact that there's a vampire, a werewolf, uh, you know, supercomputer, a witch, whatever it is, if you can give them more actual, factual, um, solid life bases to, to um, build into the whole storyline, it makes it easier to step out a little bit and say, okay, I'll give you a witch who can call lightning from the sky. Because, you know, yeah, that whole thing about the stock exchange was kind of accurate or, you know, the way the guy handled the gun was accurate or, you know, how the, the helicopter pilot spoke, you know, was, was on point. So, but if you start to just like make everything up and don't have really a clue as to what you're writing, I, I think then people are like, listen, I'm not going to be able to get to the part about the witch because I didn't even like what you wrote about the shotgun. So. I, yes. I think it fits in with that. If you have stuff going on in business and, and business drives so much of our world these days, uh, you can't turn on the TV at night without hearing about different money flows in the markets or what the Fed is doing or those kind of things and how it in, influences politics. To me, that makes a story more believable if, if you're hearing about that in the same world. All right, I'm going to jump in before he gets to the next one. You're not allowed to have or at least admit in public you have a favorite child, <laughs> <laughs> but do you have a favorite character? Or if you're not willing to answer that one, do you have a favorite character at the moment? Uh, I'll admit right now, I'm pretty partial to Declan uh, mm -hmm. in the series. In terms of overall favorite characters at this very moment, uh, there's a new character in the new series that's coming out. His name is Savage. And um, I like Savit a lot. There's, there's some things about Savit that I can relate to. Um, not all of his, his abilities or, or skill set, but just sort of how he sees things and, and how he relates to people. So um, he's, he's working his way in there as, as a, um, maybe a new favorite for a short period of time. But I, I wouldn't say that I disown any of them. I come back to them again. <laughs> And it's been, Unless I it's, kill them. <laughs> right. If I kill them, then, that, then I have to memorialize them. But, uh, you know, writing Dark and Queen, I'm writing from Tanya's point of view. And that's been fun to go back and see how she, th she sees things and um, how things have impacted her that I hadn't really considered before. Uh, but I, I would say in the Demon Accords right now, Declan, maybe I'm a little bit partial to. And I have a, a follow-up question, but I promised Steve he could ask one. <laughs> <laughs> Go right ahead. So on Declan, speaking of Declan, what caused you to write his parents the way that you did? The ones, you know, his mom and, you know, effectively a, relation, uh, a lesbian relationship. Oh, um, I don't know. It's just life. You come across uh, folks all the time in different uh, categories of life. And it wouldn't really be realistic if I wrote everything as, as straight uh, couples who you know, male and female couples, it's just not what you find in the world. And again, I want it to be believable. So there are going to be cases uh, all the time where you find, you know, girl-girl uh, girl couples, boy-boy couples, and the standard guy-girl. And nowadays, you know, there's, there's even, you know, people who just don't bother to identify what they are, and, and that's cool too. So I, I want to make sure that that's kind of represented in the world, because it's in the real world. So why not in my world as well? And then I'll have uh, one follow-up additional. Is there a tree that you could point to and go, that's the tree that is represented by Declan's family? Uh, there is in, in imagination, but not in real life. I don't okay. have a tree that I, I modeled that after. Uh, you're talking of the Rowan tree yes. that exists behind his aunt's uh, property. And um, nope, that's uh, just a product of the imagination. Okay. All right. Your turn, Steve. Okay, so we've we've talked about the Demon Accords. You've you've also written the Zone Wars the Zone Wars trilogy. The next fan question is: What genres or topics do you want to write about in the future? 
Well, uh, the new one is called, the, the series is called Shadows of Montshire, and the first book is called A Murder of Shadows, and it's a fantasy. So that's the, the genre I, I've been, you know, found in the back of my head over the last year or two that's been trying to get out. Um, I think I'd also someday like to write uh, maybe a non-supernatural sort of action adventure um, that maybe takes a regular person uh, who is not ex-SEAL or uh, ex-CIA or anything and, and puts them into an unusual situation and see if, uh, if uh, he or she can get through it just by being a basic capable adult uh, in today's world. I'm curious, and this is a question for both of you. If you if you wrote something, because you you both write in certain specific areas, if you wrote something that was as different as a non-paranormal character, male action hero thriller kind of thing, um, do you think your your readers would embrace that, or would you be looking for a different group of readers? M Michael, you want to go first, or are you uh, deferring? Um, uh, <laughs> so, Cryptid Assassin is the one that you know I would think Steve would be kind of similar, but he has uh, mech suits. So, I mean, while he's a, a big burly man, he doesn't have any superpowers. Mech suit is kind of equivalent. And for me, I, I mean, I like the, to read a little bit of what's normal, but my day to day is normal. I mean, I'm around normal people all of the time and I don't go to, for personal preference, I don't go and read things about what I can go experience right outside. So I wouldn't have as much of a desire to write that. Unless John does something, I'm like, oh, shit, that's fun. Let's do something <laughs> like that. <laughs> uh, I think that the idea comes to, I get a lot of ideas for all over the place all the time. And, uh, and I do a lot of what ifs. Um, I wonder about if something occurred kind of crazy. And of course, in today's world right now, we've got crazy time. So it's not as far fetched. Um, how, how would I react or how would I do or, or what would I do? And uh it makes me think that I could write a character that, that was a normal person. Maybe they have a, a couple hobbies that are halfway cool, but they're not, you know, ex-military or, or uh, molecular Airwolf? biologist or, or a werewolf um, or have um, psychic powers. What about the, the, the show Airwolf where, or MacGyver, where he's just smart? Yeah, no, those are, those are great. I think smarts are, are what set us apart from everything else on the planet. And um, if we fail to use our smarts, that's when we get into trouble. And you, as a, as a kid, I grew up in and around the Adirondack Mountains. And in the wintertime, uh, our Boy Scout instructor was merciless. He'd take us out in sub-zero weather and have us camp out. Uh, we did survival training as teenagers that, um, I guess he was an ex-Marine drill instructor. So to him, this was just normal way to treat people. But we would go out and do some really kind of crazy things. And I loved it. I thought that was great. Um, and, and that sort of background of being able to do uh, with very little, I think, is, is something that I um, sort of admire and that I, I think that uh, um, I've always aspired to it. I try to teach my kids to do it. Uh, my wife grew up in a family where that was just sort of run of the mill and nothing was special about being able to go out and build a shelter and, you know, <laughs> create a fire. You, know, she said, you, yeah. you weren't impressing her during the dates, huh? No, this is a very hard to impress my wife. So, um, so I just sort of see that as, as kind of the ideal of the push for is that you have a lot of life skills and, and kind of be able to handle crazy situations if they pop up. You, you brought that into Chris Gordon's dad and his two pals, his two military pals. And so you really kind of wove into the stories, the believability of why he had this experience real early. Yeah. Um, and Gramps, who is the, the paternal figure that raised him, his grandfather, uh, right. is an amalgam of people that I know. And he's an amalgam of about two, maybe three people. And the set of skills that he has uh, are not uncommon where I, I grew up. You would find you know people of of some military service background or, you know, they're farmers or uh, they're search and rescue people and they have I don't know, a diverse background of skills that let them find their way through emergencies when they pop up and keep calm and use their brains and, and think their way out of situations where other folks might just panic and die on the spot. Uh, and they're, they find out they're 15 feet from a road, but they never saw it because they, they didn't, you know, take the time to calm down and, and work their way through the situation. 
All right, last Steve. question from me, and then then we'll turn this over to Michael, uh, because he is he's he's got that whole fanboy thing really working right now. <laughs> <laughs> but last question from me is: What has surprised you? Um, what what changes in your life have surprised you since you've become a full time author? Uh, changes in my life, or yes. about being an author? Well, no, in, in your life, what, what has changed since you're not going to the office anymore and, and you have complete, essentially complete control over your time? Uh, I was surprised at how quickly I adapted to it. I'm not sure I could remember how to tie a tie right now, and I'm kind of proud of that. And um, the fact I wake up by maybe 8 o'clock in the morning and don't have to rush out at 5.30 like I used to, and, and just how very quickly I got used to that schedule. Um, I think that surprised me. I thought it was going to be more regimentation and quickly discovered that, nope, I can, I can relax and kick back and, and uh, enjoy life a little bit. And you've actually been able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like I said, uh, writing for three hours to four hours a day, it probably uses up most of my built up um, storyline. And then I typically need to, to take a break and just going out and getting either in the natural world or out among humans. Uh, is where the next set of storylines usually build themselves from. What are some of your favorite authors that you read, you know, for to regenerate? You know, Stephen King on writing talked about, hey, you need to keep reading. You need to keep filling the well. And so where or what genres or what do you do to fill your well? Oh, God, I go through a lot of different books. Um, since I moved over here to Maine, I discovered a local author named Paul Dorian who writes sort of a, um, a police procedural, but it's from a Maine warden standpoint. Uh, he's, he's done a great job of being accurate with uh, the, you know, the way that the warden service uh, operates. Um, but there, there really tend to be sort of murder mysteries and that's not my normal genre, but I, I enjoy the way he's done them. Uh, back into sci-fi, you know, I, I read a lot of Alan Dean Foster, Robert Heinlein, um, I like a lot of Patricia Briggs right now in the urban fantasy genre. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, Jim Butcher's books. I've read all of his books. Um, Charlene Harris. I liked her Sookie Stackhouse for some of uh, the color that she put into it. That's uh, specific to uh, New Orleans and Louisiana. Um, I, I started on Tolkien when I was a kid. So that's something I've gone back to occasionally to, sort of regenerate ideas and thoughts. Um, but, but really, there are very few authors in the sci-fi world um, that I haven't at least touched on a few of their books, if not a lot of their books. And uh, I'm always searching for something to read, and I read them very quickly. I've been sort of a um, um, cookie monster with books. I just eat them up and, and go through them. And as you know, Michael, you have to read if you're going to write, and you have to um, let your mind expand and let other people lead you down. And, and there's so many of them that are much better writers than I am. And I'll be like, oh my God, I hate this guy. He's such a good writer. Or this woman is such a good writer. Um, but let me have another one of their books right away because I want to <laughs> see what happens next. Well, I know that Steve is actually a murder or, or more of a police procedural type person. Um, have you actually heard of this particular writer, Steve? I have not, but I, I am curious about it. So when we go through and edit this, I'm going to uh, write that name down and, and check that out, check the series his, out. His character is uh, uh, Mike Bodich, B-O-W-D-I-C-H. That is good. Good first name choice. That and John. I've noticed that a lot of us create strong Johns and Jacks. <laughs> Jacks, I don't know what? what? Yeah, you know, Jack, John, it's like the J naming scheme just lends itself toward action adventures so well for us. I don't watch a lot of television or in movies necessarily either, but do you, and if so, which ones do you like? Oh, I would watch um, uh, anything I can see if I had the time. Um, I'd be a movie junkie if I was allowed to be, but I, I'm forced out of the house occasionally and away from Netflix and, and things like that. Um, I uh, love the John Wick movies, uh, the action in those and the, um, obviously they are above and beyond what anybody could reasonably expect to get into, but the training that they put into Keanu Reeves in order to go through those action scenes and the choreograph is, is just amazing and, uh, and so accurate and so, um, 
real life that it allows me to suspend disbelief on um, what he's actually doing in terms of body count. So I love those. Those are fun. Um, I like the Underworld movies quite a bit uh, with Kate Beckinsale. Uh, if I mention her name, my wife rolls her eyes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You know, one of the things that I really enjoy is being an author, especially when it came time to um, have photo shoots of my characters. You know what? I found out that the only pretty women I'm ever allowed to digitally put on my computers are my characters. That was a little liberating. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I will have them photoshopped in that tight suit. <laughs> It's required. It's for the, the book. I have to do it, it. It is required. And I've only had my wife ask me one time, what is that? I go, oh, it's one of my characters. And she just like, oh, okay. I was like, oh, this is awesome. <laughs> yeah. So I have my wife and two adult daughters and they'll all turn their heads and look at me and say, why is she wearing a skin tight cat suit? When that sells. Do you like the food that comes on this table? Yes, it sells. Yes. Yes. It that sells is. books. That's why I do it. Yes, I actually did for the first. I never would do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tried. I I tried the first major photo shoot of a model, um, which is uh, her name is Helen Diaz, and it's out of England. I told him I want combat boots. We're not going to put this person in any sort of heel. And they came out horrible. I'm like, what's wrong here? Well, they didn't come out horrible. Come on, she's a beautiful woman. From the standpoint of creating covers, it was much more difficult when you just put them in flats. And I had to give in because I tried. I was going down that path of just normal, what it works. And it wasn't the same. So the second photo shoot, another thousand pictures, by the way, um, we had to build kind of a combat boot, but it had a bit of a heel to it. And then we etched in between the heel and the front, we blackened it in. So, you know, sometimes you find out what happens is really what you need to do. So... I had another question, but unfortunately I sideswiped myself and went down. So from the standpoint of questions that you get a lot, or actually has becoming an author changed you materially except on social media? Uh, I, I'm not quite sure I understand materially. Well, um, have you become accustomed or has it changed you in such a way? Like for instance, we do a thing called 20 books to 50 K. It's something we do to give back to the author community. And we had an event in Bali one time and I was talking to another author this morning and he goes, it was at Bali that he realized how, how life was different because he was an author. He was around other authors. They were all enjoying the sunset over the ocean as we're talking about this business that we're in and the realization that it changed him materially, that he wasn't going down this other path now that he was a full-time author and so on and so forth. Yeah, no, it definitely has changed uh, my life and, um, and my family's lives. Uh, I can remember at one point when I had first started writing Demon Accords and we were talking about sending our, our daughters to college and um, College was not inexpensive, and we were talking about how to pay for it. And I suggested, gee, maybe my books will someday help that out. Well, lo and behold, my books paid for it, and uh, and my kids came away without student loans. And mm -hmm. during the, the same time that we were able to to pay for college, we were able to take some really neat trips uh, to different places around the world as a family. We got to go to Rome. We got to go to France, Morocco, Spain. Um, we went to places within the country like Arizona and uh, Los Angeles and, and, and Las Vegas. Las Vegas was one of our, our best trips that we had. And, and it was in a book. It was a write-off. Well, exactly. Every time I take a trip, I find inspiration from the location. And Absolutely. those locations find their way into my book. And if that happens to be a write-off on my taxes, so be it. And then so do either of your daughters write? Yes, they both are good writers. They both have been prodigious readers. Um, uh, the oldest is actually an English teacher, so I, I don't really want her to read my grammar most of the time <laughs> because she knows a lot more about it than I do. But, uh, and she teaches English as a second language to uh, uh, young children who come into the country and, and need that skill. Uh, and she writes, and she's working toward writing her first set of books, and she's written some some sci-fi a little bit. She's written some dystopian type stuff. Um, and being a full-time teacher, she doesn't have a lot of time for it. So that's one of her hobbies. 
Uh, my youngest is a very good writer. Uh, she's very focused on a career in um, public service as a nonprofit uh, person. And she does a lot of writing in her work to uh, uh, help her achieve the goals of, of the job and hasn't really had the time yet in her young career to, uh, to set aside and start doing her own writing. But I've told them both that I expect the book out of each of them at the very least. So <laughs> laying down that dad law, you That's will. Right. <laughs> I don't care there. if you, uh, it doesn't matter what awards, what accolades, if I don't book. You I think they'll me. both be a better, a better writers than I am. Uh, but the thing is they got to come up with a book because they can do it. I know they can. And I think they'll be very good at it. John, this has been amazing. And, you know, probably after this recording is over, I'll get to ask you a few more questions. But thank you so much for bringing the time or taking the time to talk with us. Oh, you know? thank you so much for having me. I'll let you know this is my first podcast ever. Uh, what? And, and my That's very crazy. first face to face interview ever. Wow. Really? Really. <laughs> let me yeah, just it, say that you're really good at this. <laughs> yes, really? you really are. I mean, I, I, I explain this to people, but I have a certain fears that, that I progressed in through my business life. And so reaching out to you was me getting over one of those fears and um, you know, you replying back and, and I went through the back door, so to speak, where, you know, you have like, if you're interested in any questions, go here. But if you're press, take this one. And so I'm like, you know what? Screw this. I'm going to go the press route and just say, you know, it's a, for a podcast, at least I'm being legitimate about this. You know, it can help him if it's a few hundred extra client or fans, that would be fantastic. And so, you know, I'm like, okay, so I've told the story, but the first time I sent an email to Steve, which was another one of those where I have to get over my fear. Um, I got an automatic email back from Steve. Hi, I'm on vacation for Christmas. I'll talk to you sometime next year. So it was nice to actually get back a response from you fairly quickly. And I didn't have to antagonize for weeks like Mr. And, yes. Campbell made me do. And I will never hear the end of that. <laughs> oh, hell no. No, you won't. <laughs> so, so John, for people interested in your books, what's the first book in the Demon Accord series? God Touched. God Touched. Okay. And you've got a new book, brand new series, Murder of Shadow, coming April, May 5th. May 5th, yep. And can we reach out to you again for another interview on this? Anytime you like. It was fun. I enjoyed it immensely. Thank you so much. And what's the best place for people to learn more about you? Uh, the, the best place for um, overall information would be my website, johnconroe.com. Uh, the place where I go the most to uh, post information is probably the Demon Accords Facebook page. Uh, I have uh, brought on board a, a new person to handle my social media. and. Um, She's also my youngest, so she uh, and far more skilled at Instagram than I am. So you'll probably see a lot more Instagram and Facebook posting at a higher caliber than I've done before. <laughs> Excellent. So this person doesn't have to get to know you. No, nope, she knows me pretty well, but, but she has to get over it. She's, she's uh, not a 55 year old man. And so she's like, dad, we're going to have to work on this because my approach is going to be a little different than yours. So, <laughs> so there, there's a little learning curve there. How do, how do I want things to come out? as? But you just well. have to say, this is a cool Conroe. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Let us know when she gets you going to TikTok. TikTok. All right. I'll ask her about that. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> John, thanks so much for being on the show. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Stephen, so much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, John.